All right. Hi, everybody. It's great to see you. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome on this very wonderful Wednesday, a little bit warmer and not so wet as yesterday. Um, it's great to be with you all this evening. I cannot wait to jump back into our conversations about out of school time programs tonight. Um, and so I just want to, um, we'll start in a second. I'm going to kick it over to my wonderful colleague, James, um, who uh, has done a great job in putting the content together for you this evening um, and is going to be your go to guy for OST this year. Um, but we'll really quickly start with norms. James, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so just very um, sim, uh, same routine as usual. If you just if you haven't already, if you just want to drop your name, your ward, and what schools your children attend in the chat, um, we'd love to see your beautiful faces. If you're able to keep your camera on um, tonight, uh, we understand if not, but we always love to see you. Um, and we just want to reiterate our norms for all of our Pave events. If you tend to pay a talker, push yourself to listen more. Although I will say, when we're on Zoom, you can always put in the chat. Um, and then uh, if you tend to be a big listener, challenge yourself to speak up and, and share a little bit more um, and get yourself out of your comfort zone today. So we are really, really excited. Um, thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, can't wait for this discussion. And, and James, I'll kick it over to you. Perfect. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. So I'm just going to take a quick look at this as what our agenda is going to look like for today. So today we're going to dive into OST programs and we're going to look mainly at four different things. So first, what are OST programs? What do they look like in the district? Then we'll talk a little bit about the OST landscape, what's working in OST in the district, what are some things people still want to see. Then I'll kick it over to Carrie for where the power lies for OST. And then we'll finish up with just some next steps and a discussion about OST programs in the district. But I'm going to go ahead and get us started by just uh, telling y'all a little bit about me. I know some of you know me, some of you haven't met me yet. Uh, so my name's James. I'm one of the new program coordinators here at PAVE. Uh, and just a little bit about me and my educational journey. So I think for me, my educational journey really began when I was growing up. I was raised by a single mother in a low-income household. So growing up, I really saw just a lot of the gaps in education that I had versus some of my wealthier peers. But even throughout my whole childhood, my whole time growing up, my mother was always there supporting me. She was like my biggest advocate. She would, you know, stay up late with me and my sister, practicing times tables, reading books, and always pushing us to become the best that we could in education. And that's a lot of the reason I'm here. Uh, and one of the reasons I've always been passionate about OST programs is because OST programs has been something I've been doing my entire life. You can see in the corner, I've got just a very small photo of me back when I was a fifth grader during my first OST program, basketball after school. You'll see a very long, uh, long hair trend throughout all my old photos. Uh, then in high school and middle school, I started to coach myself, uh, which was really, really fun for me. I coached basketball and soccer all throughout high school for kids, third through fifth grade. Uh, and I really, really loved that experience. So the last few years after college, I was teaching. I was teaching sixth grade middle school back in Texas. Uh, and even then I was coaching. So I was coaching soccer. So I've always seen the way OST programs can make a difference on students' lives, how important it is to them. It was important to me. It was important to the students that I spent my time with the last few years, and it's something I'm really passionate about. And this summer, I had the chance to spend some time uh, doing some work with Christina Henderson's office just to look at OST programs in the district, see what's working, see what's not working. Uh, and that's what I'm going to tell y'all a little bit about today. So moving to the next slide, what are OST programs? So OST programs are really just anything that students are doing when they aren't in the classroom. So it's things they do before school, it's things they do after school, things they do in the summer, on the weekends, it can be during breaks, it can be, you know, last week you had a few days off for like Veterans Day, 
that's out of school time programs. It's just any time where they aren't in the classroom, aren't learning uh, in that like traditional classroom setting. And why do they matter? So they're important for a lot of reasons. One, academic enrichment. Studies have shown that students who do OST programs tend to have stronger academic outcomes. I saw that when I was teaching, especially during the pandemic, that kids who went to OST programs were more likely to show up for class, which had stronger academic outcomes. It gives them the chance to like explore activities and find the joy in learning, do things that they aren't always able to do in the classroom or don't have as much time to, whether that's like arts programs, music programs, sports programs, and really explore their passions. It helps with social emotional learning and building social skills, getting to interact with more students. And it's also just a safe, productive space for kids while caregivers are working. So if parents have work after school or can't pick them up immediately, it gives them something to do that is a safe place. It's a place where they can learn, grow, find joy, and enjoy themselves. So OST programs are a super important part of any child's life. So I'm just curious in the chat, I'd love to drop uh, in there. What are some of the OST programs your children have participated in? What are some of the ones you've seen in the district? Some of the ones you've enjoyed just so we can see what kind of OST programs we're participating in here. I'll go ahead, drop those in. It's not letting me see the chat right now, which is unusual. Let me see if I can fix that real fast. There's some. So we've got... Ooh, quite a lot of them coming in. We've got instrumental music, basketball camp, soccer, swimming. We've got, ooh, dance and theater. I loved theater in high school. That was a lot of fun. Voice lessons, swimming. Oh, so like a great amount of awesome programs. So I think that's just really important just so we can see like what everyone else is participating in. What are some of the things that other people's kids enjoy? I see Lego League. Oh my God, that sounds really cool. Uh, basketball camps, drum line. So DC scores. Yes, I went to one of their events. It was so cool. So I love all those different programs. Uh, and if you see any in the chat that you're interested in, ask that person about it. So Benefits, we covered this a little bit earlier, but we've got that improved academic performance, improved attendance and participation, development of social emotional skills, and improved fitness and wellness are some of those benefits that we see. Uh, and just in DC, this is kind of like an overview of what OST programs look like. So one of the things that I learned this summer when I was really diving into OST programs here in the district is that it's really just the wild west of programs. I mean, Everyone has some kind of a say in OST programs. So Learn24 runs those programs. DCPS has OST programs they run. So do charter LEAs. So does the Department of Parks and Recreation, Child Care Centers, the Department of Employment Services. So everyone kind of has a hand in OST programs. But in a lot of ways, that can make it difficult to figure out, you know, who has a program, when are they, finding the information you need for them, because so many people are in charge of and oversee different OST programs in the district. So we're going to dive into the OST landscape. We're going to look at some of the issues parents have identified in the past for OST programs, and then also some of the solutions that y'all have recommended to help improve them. So... What are some of the barriers that exist to OST access? So I've got a survey that PAVE parents took a few years ago that kind of shows some of the big buckets of things that parents have identified as issues with OST programs. So first we've got, of course, programs didn't interest their children, too expensive, a lack of transportation, a lack of information about what programs exist, difficulties with the times, so say you're working during a session, having difficulty getting into those programs, or times conflicting with work schedules. So we're going to dive into five of these different buckets. So we're going to start by talking about sign-up systems and some of the issues there. Then we're going to take a look at some of the issues with transportation financial aid, information sharing, and then lastly, SPED inclusion, and how some of those issues affect parents and affect access to OST programs in the district. So let's go ahead and head to sign-up systems. 
So one of the things that I learned very quickly about sign-up systems in the district is that it's very much a very decentralized process, whereas schools have a very centralized process. And what I mean by that is each entity and each provider has their own database for signups and program information. They all have their own deadlines. They all have different prices, quality, content. So everyone does it differently, which makes it really hard to sign up for programs because there's no set deadline for everyone. There's no set price. There's no set quality. You really have to go research each and every individual program, which is a lot different than when you think about the way the district does schools with the lottery system, where, you know, whether you love or hate the lottery system, it is a centralized place where you can find all the information you need about schools in the district. We don't have anything like that for OST programs. Uh, and then just like an example to really drive that point in is like Learn24 last year in 2022, they identified 91 programs or awarded 91 programs funding. So that's 91 different programs you have to research, 91 different signup systems to navigate, 91 different prices, 91 different quality programs, 91 different subjects that those programs hit. And that's just the Learn24 programs. That doesn't include DCPS. That doesn't include LEAs. It doesn't include DPR. So every single system does it differently, which makes it really hard to figure out which program is best. A lot of the times people hear about programs through word of mouth, which isn't always the best way to do it because you kind of have to be in the know to know what programs exist out there. So that's one issue parents have identified time and time again is just with the signup systems and difficulty in finding all the information. And then even, you know, the times that you sign up for those programs. So like if it's a sign up at 2 p.m., you might not be able to sign up for a program program that you really need. So moving into the next issue parents have identified, that's transportation. So according to an old study by the Policy Studies Associate from a couple of years ago, 53% of parents um, surveyed listed transportation as a key barrier to accessing OST programs. And that makes sense for a lot of reasons, right? So many struggle to pick up kids with the current program hours. So say it's like a summer program and it ends at three, but you get out of work at five. That makes it a lot harder to go pick up your student. Um, say, for instance, your child is young. So say you have a five-year-old or a four-year-old or a six-year-old. If those program hours don't work for you, you're not going to be able to send them alone on public transit. So it's either you don't go to the program or you find some kind of alternate transportation, which you aren't always able to do. And we can even see when it comes to transportation in the district that a lot of families aren't necessarily using the public transit for issues like safety or their students being too young. So the DC Policy Center identified that just in the last year, only 38% of people grades kindergarten through 12th grade enrolled in Kids Ride Free. You know, it makes sense that it was around 38% because of the pandemic, but even before the pandemic, only about 60% of people were using Kids Ride Free. So not everyone is using it uh, for various reasons, whether it's they're too young or whether it's they don't feel safe. But that also means that if OST programs don't have hours that fit for parents, then they aren't always able to attend those programs because they can't get that transportation. And then lastly, sometimes uh, something we've heard again and again is that buses for students with IEPs don't always extend out to those OST programs. So you might have your bus to and from school if you have an IEP, but it's not necessarily going to take you to an OST program on the other side of the city. So you might not have access to those buses either, making it even harder to access those OST programs. Now, next one that I want to dive into a little bit is just the current landscape for scholarships and financial aid. So there's a few main scholarships for OST programs that people can take advantage of. Some of them are really good. Some of them have really nice parts, but there's also some issues that come with each of them. So the first main scholarship that we're looking at is the Learn24 scholarship. So a few good things about this. One, uh, they really target it at some of those students who are most in need. So that's one of the key things is targeting some of those at-risk student populations. Additionally, if there's additional funding, Learn24 has told me, and they say on the website that they also will extend it to families who are more middle income, depending on the availability. So there's lots of benefits for applying for the Learn24 scholarship, even if you don't think you're going to qualify, because it all has to do with the availability of funds. 
but there are still some issues with it. So first, applicants already have to have an OST spot. So if you're having trouble accessing the signup systems, or there's not programs that fit for your times, or you don't get into a program that's ideal for your child, you can't qualify for these scholarships since you already have to have an OST spot to get those. Second, uh, it requires computer access. So you can't fill out this scholarship on your phone. So like if you only have your phone, you wouldn't be able to make the PDFs since they require you to submit PDFs to show your income and to show that you have need for the scholarship. And then lastly, it's only in English, which means that for anyone who's not dominant in the English language, this isn't a scholarship that would be easy to apply for. You'd need either your student to translate or somebody at a library or someone to help you translate the scholarship so you can apply, which just prevents another barrier for people who need funding. Next, we've got the DPR scholarship. So the DPR scholarship is really good in that it's like a reduced rate scholarship. So it can cut the cost of DPR programs anywhere from 50% to 75% if you apply for it. But just like with the Learn24 scholarship, there are some issues in it that make it harder to use than it needs to. Uh, so first off, parents have to complete the scholarship process before applying to programs. And it's a pretty long process. So you have to apply all the way back in March. So if you want summer programs, you know that you have to go three months in advance to start applying for the scholarship. It involves filling out all your forms, submitting all your income verification. And then once you've done that, you have to schedule an in-person meeting, go in, meet people at DPR. And then after that meeting, they'll decide whether or not you get that scholarship. And then after you've all done all that, even if you get approved for the scholarship, it doesn't guarantee a spot. You still have to go and do the same sign up process as everyone else. So if you go through all that, get the scholarship and still don't get a spot, you don't get to use those funds, uh, which is really tough. Uh, if you've spent all that time doing it and you were relying on that money and you got that scholarship just to still not be able to get it because of the sign up process. And then it doesn't apply to aftercare either. So it only applies to during the normal hours. So if you need aftercare because the program hours don't fit for you, you're not able to use it for that. And then lastly, there are just other scholarships. So every single program has different financial aids. So this might take time to figure out or have insider info in order to figure out which programs have scholarships that you would apply for. A lot of programs that I look to, for instance, apply you to like require you to like send an email to the program people to ask about it. They don't just put all that information online. So it takes a lot of digging to figure out if any other programs have scholarships. So Moving on to information sharing. So something we've heard from parents a lot too is they're just looking for better info. And I think this is something we kind of talked about when we said there is no centralized place to find information about OST programs. It's really all over the place. So parents are looking to find more information on registration processes, scholarships, wait lists, whether or not there's more programs, whether or not those programs intend to expand or just transparency on like, how are they spending OST money? Like we got 10 million last year for OST programs. How's that being used? Where is it going? Because right now there's not a lot of information out there about really any of these OST programs that's easily accessible. You either have to know someone who's already gone through the process, know someone who's involved in the program, or just kind of get lucky. I felt like this summer when I was figuring out things about these programs, more often than not, even though I was doing it full time, more often than not, the information I found was just more off luck or talking to somebody than it was about being able to find it on the website. So we really are looking to figure out and find ways to have better information sharing so people know all they can about these programs. And then the last one we're kind of looking at is just SPED inclusion. Um, and this is something that I learned about this summer that was really uh, tough to hear about. So I think just program parents have told time and time again that there's kind of a lack of awareness and knowledge surrounding disability rights, needs, and laws. There's a limited amount of caregivers who are properly trained and accommodating for special needs students. 
there's a lack of oversight to make sure programs are accommodating students. So they might say they're doing it, but nobody's really going in to check that it's being done. And then there's just a lack of programs with inclusive programming. I know I had the chance uh, this summer to talk to a few PAVE parents just about their experience with SPED inclusion and OST programs. Uh, and one of the stories that one of the parents told me was about going to an OST program, telling them, you know, this is my daughter, here's her IEP, these are the needs that she has, and the OST program basically saying, look, we can't reject her, but like these things that we have, like we're not able to offer those, we're not able to give those to her. Um, even though they're required to. So I just think that there's a lot of programs out there that aren't necessarily able to accommodate for special needs students in the ways that they need to. And that's something we're looking at trying to improve for this next year. So looking at some of our OST wins in the past, so what are some of the things that we've already accomplished? So in 2018, we got an additional 10.4 million for OST programs. In 2020 through 2021, we protected OST from cuts, and we got some small increases to funding over these years. So a lot of people uh, in PAVE have been working on OST issues from the beginning. It's not something we started last year. It's something PAVE leaders have consistently identified as an issue and something they want to see improved upon in our district. And then in 2022, last year, they secured an additional $15.3 million in OST funding, and they secured an updated needs assessment to inform the community-driven strategic plan. So when people are making decisions about OST programs in the district, they're listening to families, they're listening to parents, they're listening to students, and they're listening to OST providers to make sure they're making informed decisions when they make choices about OST. And that should be coming out in December, so really, really soon. And then what are some things we still want to see? So first, they want to see better information sharing. We've heard that time and again. What programs are available? How do we sign up? How do we access these financial aid options? Something we've also heard about that parents want is redesigning the cost structure and requirements for vouchers and financial aid because DC is an expensive city to live in. Everyone knows it's an expensive city to live in. So we really need to just expand what we consider um, needing financial aid and needing financial assistance so more people can get it because $700 for a DPR program in the summer is expensive for anyone, especially middle income families, lower income families. And we really need to expand who can qualify for those. And the last thing we've heard is increasing the quality and we'll talk about quality later. And then just the variety of OST programs, especially east of the river. I know I spent most of my time working in sports programs, but sports programs can't be the only things that are offered. We would love to see more arts programs, more theater programs, music, art, video game programs, esports are something kids are very much into these days. So really expanding what we consider OST programs so kids have all their interests fit. So that covers some of the issues that we see, some of our big OST wins, and what we still want to see in these programs. So now that we know about some of these lists of issues in OST programs, who are some of the folks in charge of getting them fixed? So I'm going to pass it over to Carrie to kind of go over some of the power brokers and where the power lies in OST programming. Thanks, James. Um, before I actually get started, um, as you were going through there, there were, I think there were a couple of questions in the chat, um, mostly about the, if you could just go back to the um, slide with the, about the different scholarship options. So Learn24, DPR, um, and some of the other ones. I think Tracy um, and Monique had some questions just about signing up for DPR programs um, or the DPR scholarship if you don't have the funds and the um, Learn 24. Like, what does it mean to, you know, if you already have a spot, that sort of thing. Um, so I'll, I'll ask, I'll voice over Monique's question. So Monique asked, um, how do you sign up for DPR programs if you don't already have the funds? So can you just walk through that DPR scholarship one first, and then we'll go to Tracy. Tracy's question, and then I'll take over once we make sure all the questions are answered. Yeah, sure. So kind of the way, uh, and these are great questions. I'm sorry, I couldn't see them when they came in. Yeah. So kind of the way the DPR scholarship uh, works and kind of the process for the scholarship is that you apply in the beginning of March. 
So basically, you have to know uh, in March that you want to apply for DPR programs in the summer, a few months in advance. And essentially, the way it works is they have kind of like a pre-screening. So you go through and you submit certain documents. So that's things like income verification, it's proof of residency, things like that, that would prove that you qualify for their scholarship program. And you just send that to them. And once they get that, and once they've looked it over, uh, and this again is still a few months before the program, that's when they set up a meeting with you. And when they set up that meeting with you, you bring all those documents and paper, they go over them again with you, and then they let you know if you qualify for the reduced rate, whether that's 50 or 75%. And all of this is before you apply for the scholarship programs. It's not until the actual summer where you are go through and you actually apply for and sign up for the DPR programs. So I think one of the issues we saw this summer is that parents would go through this process and they would get approved for it. And then they wouldn't get a spot even after going through all of that because they couldn't get a spot during the sign up process. We have seen other DPR programs in like other cities that guarantee spots, but this one doesn't necessarily do that. And I see there's a comment in the chat. Let's see. I can get it up. Perfect. So, oh, cool. I can see them now. Yep. Good. I'm glad that answered it. And then the other question, what does already have an OST spot mean from Tracy? It's a great question. So when I say what does already have an OST spot, that basically means like, say you wanted to do DC scores. Uh, if you wanted to do DC scores, you would have already had to like sign up for DC scores, be approved for DC scores, and then your student would have a slot in DC scores. But after you've been approved in DC scores as a free program, but after you've been approved for it and you have been accepted into the program, that's when you can apply for the scholarship and get approved for the scholarship. So the scholarship happens after you've already agreed to do the program, which is problematic because you don't necessarily know that money is going to come. I will say for the Learn24 scholarship, this is a new scholarship program. So there's like lots of room for them to like make improvements. It's the first year they've doing it. So hopefully they make some of those improvements and hear some of that feedback. But you have to have already gotten a spot in one of the Learn24 programs like DC scores to get it. Cool. I see a Melody saying I've applied in the past and was approved, but not given a seat. Yep. That's one of the unfortunate parts. It depends on the camp. Yep. I see you. That's question. Yeah. So it depends which camp you're applying for, but scholarship signups for DPR camps do start in the March for the scholarship program. So just coming off mute real quick. Are you saying that some camps, the signups open later for DPR camps? Depends. Yeah. When I met them over the summer, they told me they still had some programs that were open in like August for kids to sign up to. So it really depends on the program since they have like yeah. some summer programs. They also have some like during the school year programs, weekend programs, things like that. Right. But I think, yeah, but I think specifically summer camp, if I remember correctly, those spots go really quickly mm -hmm. when it's for the prime camps, as soon as they open up. Yeah. And so if people aren't in line to get scholarships until after that, then they, again, you're not getting a spot. So you've done, done all that work and there's no spot. So I do think there's some advocacy around that issue in okay. itself. Absolutely. I see another question. I totally agree with that. Yeah, that is definitely something. And then I see, are the DPR scholarships only available for summer camps? So the reduced rate is just for their programs in general, but they do apply for the summer camps. This is Renee coming off mute. I just wanted to reemphasize that those scholarships and those slots do not necessarily transfer to the DPR therapeutic recreational camps mm -hmm. either. But I have had direct firsthand experience with the process of trying to negotiate for scholarship prior to DPR opening, but that was well before COVID and it required that I had advanced knowledge to even go to DPR on Gerard Street and bring all the documentation. Um, 
So again, I want to really say that I do have a direct firsthand experience with trying to negotiate that process from the perspective of a TANF and food stamp recipient trying to get scholarships in advance. Yet lo and behold, the, it, the camps are already filled. The scholarship doesn't cover your transportation problems, getting your kid to camp consistently, even with scholarship. And they definitely don't cover uh, therapeutic recreation. Mm. You know, even if you needed to have therapeutic rec only camp, then there's no discuss there's nobody to get you there to that camp other than perhaps Medicaid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's like the issue, like with yeah, with so many of these scholarship programs, is that like they don't necessarily guarantee the access. So you go through all that work and they make it very difficult to get the scholarships, and then you still don't get the spot, which is just a frustrating experience for anyone. Mr. Say you want pizza now. Cool. And I see another question from Jeanette. Are there plans to centralize links and info to these programs on one site like DC Gov? Or can PAVE create a web page we can point families to? I have not heard from the DC government that there are any specific plans to centralize these links. I think that's something that we could consider and think about for our advocacy this year, uh, since it is very difficult to find all this info and it's spread in so many different places. And that's certainly something we can help with too, with finding some of these different informations and pointing y'all to what you need. <laughs> I don't know about pizza, Melody. <laughs> All right, do we have any other questions before I pass it over to Carrie? I can see the chat now. So if any others come in. I see, would non-traditional childcare fall under OST? Yep, it would. Before and after care is OST. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Carrie to talk about where the power lies in OST programs. Thanks, James. Um, I'm going to try and refocus uh, my attention uh, to not think about pizza and think about <laughs> OST programs. Um, but James, if you don't mind just clicking through for me um, to get back to um, the, where the power lies slides. And so, um, I just want to start by saying that some of these, uh, slides might look familiar, um, based on, uh, if you've seen sort of this content before, but we tried to add in a couple to just be really clear and specific about, uh, where the power lies for OST in particular. Um, so there's some that might look familiar and we'll talk about the specifics of OST, um, but then we have some new ones in here as well. So James, you can go to the next one. So first and foremost, as with all things education, we always start with this slide because if we're talking about something that the mayor's office is doing, it's important for us to just name in a system under mayoral control in the mayor's agencies in the DC government. Um, Paul Kine is the deputy mayor of education and the DMEs or the DME and the DME's office is in charge of OST. So, um, and we'll get into uh, a little bit more of like the offices under the DME in a second. But if you remember, um, the DME is not just in charge of DCPS and they and OSI or the Office of the State Superintendent of Education. He tan like in a indirect way um, manages the public charter school board. Um, they have their own independent autonomy to run their schools in the way they want, but they still receive funding and they have to follow all the laws of DC public schools. That's why theirs is a little bit of a different um oversight relationship but the dme also includes libraries they include D udc um and he uh, also under the dme's office is the office of out of school time grants and youth outcomes program um, which houses learn 24. so there's lots of important aspects of ost um, that are on this very specific are led by the people on this specific slide so when we think about Paul Kine, our deputy mayor of education, 
any questions that you have about Learn24, DPR, um, those scholarships, financial aid program availability, Paul Kine is ultimately in charge of making sure that those things happen. Um, that is his job. He it reports to the mayor and it's his job to make sure that that he's executing on the mayor's vision, um, but it, he also can tell the mayor, here's what I'm hearing from my stakeholder community. Um, so he is really critical uh, when we're talking about out of school time program plans, um, both now and in the future, um, in terms of sharing uh, anything that is working that you want expanded, uh, whether that's programs or certain scholarship financial aid opportunities, or if we want to lift up, just like James kind of gave an overview earlier, things that are not working, <laughs> he is the person who can ultimately make the decision to make improvements in those areas. The one piece that I want to point out that we haven't talked about a ton is uh, Aussie or um, Dr. Christina Grant, who is the superintendent of Aussie. Aussie is in charge of the 21st century uh, learning grant. And that's a federal grant, so they get money from the federal government to be able to provide uh, schools or other community organizations, OST providers, funding for out-of-school time programs. And Aussie is the entity that manages that grant. So if there's any of our OST providers that get funding from that particular grant, Christina Grant is sort of the head person um, over that agency that is really critical in terms of advocating around those funds and processes. Now, I think we've talked a little bit about like, what does this look like? What do OST programs look like at schools? And that looks a little different for DCPS and charter schools, which is why we wanted to make sure that these were separated out um, for today. So DCPS does offer aftercare um, at schools. In some schools, it's free. In some schools, there's a charge similar with before care. Um, but Chancellor Lewis Fairby is really the, the head of that agency who is making those decisions, um, again, under the guidance, his, his boss is Paul Kine, and Paul Kine's boss is Mayor Bowser. So the in terms of the decision-making, that's sort of the order of operations there, but Lewis Faraby is the person who's making decisions about what does this look like for DCPS um, in our offering of out-of-school time programs at DCPS school sites specifically. Now, for the public charter school board, that's a little different. Um, uh, Dr. Michelle Walker Davis is the executive director of the public charter school board or PCSB, but her main job is just to make sure that any public charter school that wants to be a part of the DC education system, she manages the process to see uh, for the public charter school board members to either approve or deny an LEA to be able to operate in the district. And then if they are operating in the district, it's her job to make sure that they are holding up to the promises they made. So when they applied to be a school, they the every public charter school network or LEA says, Here this, here's our plan um, to provide a great education to kids. And if they're not doing it, then the public charter school board is responsible for monitoring that and providing oversight and saying, hey, you're not living up to X, Y, and Z. You need to do better by this time. Show us your plan. And if you're not, then they might end up closing the school. Um, so that's uh, Dr. Walker Davis's um, role. And so it's not, she doesn't have like direct oversight or decision-making power about an individual school's decision about out-of-school time programs. But if they are not living up to something that they promised or there's a major issue with an out of school time program, then you can definitely go to the public charter school board to flag that, talk about that and use your voice there um, in order to advocate uh, for something different. So that's like at the top, top level where out of school time programs um, in terms of leadership comes in and folks that we can direct our advocacy towards. But James, if you wanna to go to the next one, um, another really critical important office that we've talked a lot about today is DPR. Um, and so uh, Mr. Hunter is the uh, director of DPR um, and uh, Gina Topin is the uh, deputy director of uh, recreation services. And these are folks that 
we really need to have conversations with. I think there's ton, most of our questions here tonight were about um, DPR uh, camps and services. And so um, these are folks that we really want to make sure are hearing the experiences of parents, whether it be about sign up, whether it's about cost, whether it's about program availability, being able to be responsive to different family um, and student needs, whether that special education, transportation, whatever it might be. I think there's a lot of work to be done to make sure that they are hearing you. Um, in terms of all of their issues. And so this might be um, a new addition for us this year in terms of um, folks we might want to engage with. And the other thing I'll say is um, the like DPR and the Learn 24 programs that that uh, many of you had mentioned before um, that you're that you had used either to get access to a program, find information about, they are two separate entities. Um, but they are working, and it's truly a uh, credit to y'all and y'all's advocacy, um, but they are working on finding ways to coordinate better. Um, because there was a meeting, I think it was Yvette, um, Dominique, if you're, uh, I think, I, I can't remember if I saw Dominique, if she's still here. Um, but it was Yvette, Dominique, and Christine who met with um, some folks from the DME's office earlier this year, and they were like, what does coordination look like between your two offices that provide very similar services, um, mind you, in two different ways? And they didn't have, um, they didn't really have an answer, but they did say that they were going to work on it. And so we, we show this slide somewhat in isolation on purpose, um, because while they are still all under the, the same bucket of the deputy mayor of education's purview. Right now, they aren't necessarily working together um, as well as they could be. Like James had mentioned, DPR has one set of scholarship criteria and processes, whereas Learn24 has a total separate one. There's two different sign-up processes. Um, but oftentimes, the goal of these programs is the same, to make sure kids have a safe and productive place to go. Uh, whether it's after school, summer, et cetera. Um, so one of the things that we can definitely talk to folks in their office about um, as we broaden our advocacy is about, you know, we're addressing some of these barriers, cost in particular, um, but also how are you coordinating with other programs? Because a lot of families have multiple kids and one kid's in DPR and one kid's in Learn24 or a couple of mixes of both. Um, and there's a coordination between those two can go a long way. Um, so it's really important that we keep these conversations going with those folks. So James, you can go to the next one. All right, so that brings us to Learn24. Um, so uh, pay parents might have met with um, someone named Myla Yoakum uh, in the past, and Myla uh, used to be the executive director um, of the uh, Office of the Out of School Time Grants and Youth Outcomes under the DME, uh, but Myla left uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, pandemic is a time warp, so I might be a little bit off um, on that. Uh, but Myla was one of the people that we went to a lot in terms of in 2018, when we did the OST needs assessment, we did the big survey to see what was most important to parents, but we they also did a youth survey, what was most important to youth. Um, that was all done under Myla's leadership in order to make sure that the big funding wins that James had mentioned before, um, earlier in the year and in earlier in PAVE's advocacy got put to good use. Um, but Myla left um, for personal reasons. She moved to Pennsylvania to be with her family. Um, and then there was a gap um, in the, in terms of who was taking up leadership of that office for some time. And so last year when PAVE parents were calling for a re-up of that, you know, community engagement around what's needed for out of school time programs. What types of programs are parents looking for? What uh, areas do they are they most needed? What are the things that are needed for OST programs in order to remove those barriers? 
Um, there wasn't a place, there wasn't a system or process to capture the answers to those questions. You all are ready to share, you are ready to give, but nobody was leading that charge. Um, and so now that there is a new executive director of this office, um, Dr. Shanita Lowe, um, we are really excited to, to get to know her um, and hopefully uh, be able to have more conversations about the experiences that you all shared today and that we've heard from so many other PAVE parent leaders um, over the course of the past couple of years. Um, she is in charge of leading the needs assessment. Um, so some of you on this call might have taken a, a couple of surveys or joined a focus group um, to share your experiences to help inform that needs assessment. Um, but they are going to take that needs assessment to inform a community-driven strategic plan uh, to update how we do OST programs um, in the district, particularly Learn24 programs. And so Dr. Shanita Lowe is the person who we need to talk to about that. Um, so it's good to know her name and face. Um, and then uh, the OST Commission Chair is uh, Walter Peacock. Um, and the OST Commission is really important um, in terms of a, uh, strategic planning for how things are going to look in the future, um, but also for ongoing oversight. I think James and I were talking just this morning um, that one of the biggest things is like we, we feel like we got more funding for OST programs, but a lot of times it can feel like that funding sort of went in a vacuum because if there aren't more spots that are opening up, it still feels like you can't get access to affordable programs that your kids are really interested in. Um, it kind of feels frustrating and like, where did this, where did this go? Um, and without real transparency on where that funding could go and just an avenue to be able to say, this is what's going on. What is being done about this? When the DPR site inevitably clash, crashes every year at noon when sign up starts, right? Or when uh, the Learn24 program is buried um, in the website and you can't find the program finder, even though that's the whole point of the website. Um, where do you go to talk about those things? Um, and yes, you can, of course, go to your council members. Yes, you can go to Deputy Mayor Kine, but the OST Commission was built for exactly those types of conversations and questions. Um, and one of the things that we're going to talk about more in depth um, at upcoming PLE board meetings and, and in future coffee chats is what does that look like to sort of break that OST commission open? Um, because right now it's pretty, even though it's virtual, um, it's pretty behind closed doors. It's hard to find out about those meetings. Um, it's hard to attend um, because it's really, you have to like sign up like three days in advance or something like that. And like, nobody can find the sign up. Um, it's just, it's a lot of barriers to access to those those conversations. I know a vet in particular has applied to be on this commission and there weren't necessarily responses. And so um, we uh, definitely want to be able to engage in the OST conversation um, and commissions uh, a little bit more in depth this year. Um, and so these are the folks that we will uh, look to uh, talk to more over the course of the year. And then um, I'm going to get caught up on the chat in a second, I promise. But um, the last thing that I did just want to note in terms of other folks who are in the government that have power over out of school time programs um, in some way is uh, that we haven't necessarily engaged with before, but I think is important for us to broaden our outreach um, in, the, in this year and years ahead um, is the Department of Employment Services. Uh, because employment services do offer some out of school time programs, particularly for older youth. Um, so if students are in high school, there might be some opportunities through DOES or the acronym for um, Dep Department of Employment Services. Um, so that would uh, mean engaging with Dr. B Unique Morris Hughes, um, Alan Karnofsky, and uh, Thene Freeman um, in terms of folks who are leading those programs that if there are barriers, challenges to access, or if we've never heard, if you've never heard of these programs before, um, and it's something that's of interest of you, then we also need to talk to them about 
information sharing. Um, so there's lots of folks we can engage with, kind of like what James was saying is there's lots of different ways that OST programs can show up in the government. And that's not inherently bad. It's good to have options, but it is important to have, I think it was um, Jeanette that was saying, like, where is this being centralized? And how is this being made, this information about what is available through the government being made accessible to families, not just from an information standpoint, but also not cost prohibitive. And we're thinking about the other barriers to access, whether it's language access, transportation, um, access for students and their families with disabilities um, and thinking through all of those pieces. So I'll pause there. I'm gonna scroll through the chat just to see if there's any additional questions, but also folks can feel free to unmute um, if you have questions about anything that we've shared so far. Uh, Carrie, can I make a comment? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Okay, this is this is the sign of me climbing on my soapbox. So from the perspective of one of my key allies in disability uh, rights, the, the mom has a son that uses a power chair. He, um, he gets bused every day to a school out in, in uh, Virginia, Shepherd Pratt system, in, I mean, in Virginia. But when he comes home at three o'clock, at three o'clock, the bell rings, he and his power chair get back on a school bus to go home. He's lucky to get home be before five and 5.30. So, but between the hours of 5.30 and t t roughly eight, nine, 10 p.m., doesn't he still have doesn't he still have a right to have access to something to do other than stare at the walls in his in his apartment? Um, they, they live right in the middle of the city. They live right at North Capitol Street there, uh, which is like the border with Noma, for instance. And he's a nonverbal person that loves DJ music and being a DJ. You know, that is the profile of where at 16, almost 17, he should be able to have had already significant experiences in, in after school and evening programming. He needs a programming that will help him get transported to it. He needs programming that's culturally relevant, linguistically, sorry about that, Cultural, oh. <laughs> culturally and linguistically relevant because, yeah, he's a native Amharic speaker and he's interested in DJ, you know, and so if we look at it from that perspective, what does this landscape look like to him and to his family, his family of origin, you know? And I mean, and I know traffic is absolutely horrible, but who would, who's going to transport him? What can he do? You know, can it be virtual? So I'm going to get off my soapbox now, but I, but I want to keep pushing that barrier of, ah, you know, frustrating. I don't. I shouldn't be telling his mom to drive him to Virginia to get a program. I shouldn't be telling his mom he needs to drive to Maryland to get a program. He should be able to get a program right where he lives because he lives right in the center of the city, like I do, Ward One. But but simply he had the keys like Ward Four Five, the no the Noma quote unquote Noma area. Climbing off soapbox now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for sharing, Renee. And uh, oh, sorry. I. Uh, I, I feel in your, I feel so much in my heart, um, you know, what you're, you're getting at is that we just, we have to be more comprehensive and thoughtful and inclusive about our options for OST programs. And really every single person that, that we just talked about in terms of um, leaders in our government need to hear that. Uh, we have to ring that bell time and time and time again. Um, and uh I, I am both equally grateful um, for you all in the ex, uh, amazing ways that you do that. And it also breaks my heart that it requires you to um, time and time over again. Um, but I, I think at this point, we just have to keep reiterating that, you know, we're not doing right by many of our, our district residents. Um, and if there are students with disabilities, regardless of what the disability is, we have to make a, an inclusive plan. Um, so that they have the same opportunities um, and activities that that other students do. 
Um, and I see lots of hands and questions and I, I just want to uh, know um, I'm looking at the time and I know we might have to wrap in a second. Um, the, the couple things that I saw in the chat. Um, so for Shanice and, and Tamara, um, if you don't mind just dropping your questions or comments in the chat, I want us to be able to get to them. Uh, if, if not tonight during the session, um, we can definitely follow up with you afterwards. Uh, the other things that I noted in the chat or that I'm seeing in the chat are a lot of um, like, what does it look like to give school specific funds? Um, so not just through uh, some of the things we mentioned, Learn24 or DPR, um, but like I think it was Catrice, um, Mabel, um, some folks were naming uh, that, you know, schools can provide programs themselves, which is absolutely true and making sure that they have uh, resources. Um, and uh, that is definitely something that we can put on the table as part of our advocacy um, to make sure that out of school time programs is not just siloed off into some of these offices, but it's also available for individual schools so that they can make decisions that's responsive um, to their school communities. So I am so sorry. I know we are um, at time and we are gonna have to jump. Um, but if uh, I'll turn it back over to James in a second, because you know we got to take our pay photo. Um, but again, please, 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 if we didn't get to your comments or questions, just drop them in the chat. We'll hang out for a couple minutes afterwards just so folks can finish typing. Um, and we will definitely follow up afterwards. Even if you just want to drop in the chat, please call me after this because um, you don't feel like typing it. That's OK, too. Um, we promise we'll follow up. So thanks, everybody. Sorry about that, I was having some computer problems. So let's go ahead and see. gallery view. Perfect. I'll let you know in just a second when I'm ready for the photo. I can help James if you want. I'm in gallery view. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. <laughs> so name the game, everybody. If you are able to put uh, yourselves on camera, we would love to see your beautiful faces on this wonderful Wednesday. Um, if not, we understand, but um, I'll give folks a couple. Oh, look at all these people popping up. Hello, hello. Great to see you. Um, awesome. All right. So I'll give you a quick one through two. Uh, one, two, three. We do have a couple pages. Um, so bear with me. I'm going to take two pictures. All right. So one, two, three. Oh my gosh. These model shots. I love it. All right. And one, two, three. And we're set. All right. Thank you, everybody. We appreciate your time so, so much. I'm sorry we couldn't get through everything, but we will definitely follow up and talk to y'all soon. Thank you so much. Take care.